All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'd, I'd like to get started here today. Um, I have the, the privilege of, of introducing Dr. Jung Hoon Cho. Uh, he's coming here uh, from SUNY Buffalo. Um, received his BS in physics from University of Michigan, uh, then went and got an MS from the University of Wisconsin. Um, went on to get his PhD from Cornell and then did a postdoc at Weill Cornell Medicine. Um, as a postdoc, he received a NIH uh, K99 ROO Career Development Award. Um, he took that award, moved over to SUNY as a faculty position, um, and uh, his research focuses on creating quantitative maps of, of oxygen extraction fraction. He's going to talk all about that today. Um, and uh, he's won a number of awards uh, through some of the, the magnetic resonance um, organizations, um, and recently received his uh, first R01 uh, a couple months ago, I learned, so that's very exciting for, for, for Dr. Cho. Um, and so he's going to talk today about quantitative mapping of brain oxygen metabolism using MRI. And with that, Dr. Cho, we're happy to have you here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, okay uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and then I appreciate this opportunity provided by uh, Dartmouth BME. So my talk is about quantitative mapping of brain oxygen metabolism using magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. So here is the outline. First, I will go over the meaning of oxygen extraction fraction, OEF, and then I will introduce two uh, prior previous OEF mapping methods, QSM, which is quantitative susceptibility mapping, and QBOL, which is quantitative blood oxygen level dependent imaging. And then I will talk about my work on oxygen extraction fraction, OEF mapping, including biophysics modeling, data processing, validation, and initial clinical experiences. So first, what is OEF? OEF, oxygen extraction fraction, is the fraction of oxygen that tissue extracts from the blood. So if tissue is that, tissue cannot extract any oxygen from the blood, so OEF should be zero. If you know, tissue is really vibrant and then can extract a lot of oxygen from the blood, that way it can be reached out to like 60 or 70 percent. So in a healthy brain, you know, a healthy brain tissue, OEF is 30 to 40 percent, which means a tissue can extract 30 to 40 percent of the oxygen from the blood. And when you multiply this OEF, oxygen extraction fraction, with the CBF, cerebral blood flow, then you will get the total amount of oxygen consumed by tissue, which is CMRO2, cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen. So you can consider OEF as the efficiency of extracting oxygen from the blood and CBF as, a, as the input of oxygen. And this OEF is a variable for evaluating neurologic disorders. For instance, in ischemic stroke, a major therapeutic objective is to salvage plumbra. What is Prambra? Prambra is at risk tissue with reduced cerebral blood flow. So it is critical to detect Prambra precisely. However, current approaches has is have issues. For instance, perfusion-diffusion mismatch approach often overestimates the Prambra. On the other hand, uh, Prambra can be directly detected or identified by elevated OEF. Also, in various multiple uh, neurologic disorders, such as dementia, Parkinson disease, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis, brain tumors, OEF is critical to monitor disease progression and to study abnormality in brain function and to investigate therapeutic responses. However, there is no OEF mapping method of routinely available in research or clinical settings. It is because Previous PET, the positron emission tomography, or MRI, require impractical multiple vascular challenges. For instance, inhaling multiple kinds of gases. Also, they require specialized imaging sequences, which is also impractical, impractical in the clinical setting. In MRI, we look at the blood hemoglobin effects in its signal. So oxyhemoglobin is slightly dimagnetic because it doesn't have any uh, unpaired electrons. Deoxyhemoglobin is a strong paramagnetic source because it has five unpaired electrons. When tissue consumes oxygen, the deoxyhemoglobin concentration in vein increases, and MRI can detect its effect. 
and venous oxygenation Y can be defined using this deoxyhemoglobin in vein concentration. And from this Y venous oxygenation, we can estimate the OEF, oxygen extraction fraction. So here YA is basically the arterial oxygenation. Usually we assume that it's almost 100%, one. So OEF is roughly speaking one minus venous oxygenation Y. So in this talk, I will focus on two OEF mapping methods, quantitative susceptibility mapping, QSM, and quantitative blood oxygen level dependent imaging, QBOLT. I will focus on these two mapping methods because both they do not require vascular challenges, which is impractical, and both utilize a single routine MRI sequence, so they may be clinically applicable. QSM utilize quantitative susceptibility mapping, utilize the phase signal driven by the susceptibility sum between blood and the surrounding tissue. And QBOLT utilize the magnitude signal DK driven by field variation within a voxel driven by the susceptibility difference between the blood and the surrounding tissue. And then I will go over each method in more details and explain why and how I combine these two methods to make a novel biofix model, QQ. So biofix modeling starts from this MRI signal equation. So the MRI signal is an ensemble average of this phase vector e to the minus i phase over all spins. And here TE is the measurement time, or we can call it echo time in MRI. And then omega zero here is the main magnetic field strength, such as 1.5 Tesla, 3 Tesla in the clinical MRI scanner. And B here is a susceptibility field scaled to the main magnetic field strength omega zero. And in this talk, this B is important. From this B, we can estimate the signal drop by deoxyhemoglobin and susceptibility. So starting from this MRI signal equation, we can uh, consider this deoxyhemoglobin effect in magnitude signal using q volt modeling and in phase signal using QSM modeling. Let's talk about this uh, cubal modeling first. So starting from this equation, we can estimate the signal DK by the mesoscopic field. And the scale of this mesoscopic field is much smaller than voxel uh, size, which is usually one by one by one millimeter cube. And this mesoscopic field is similar to vessel size, several microns. And this mesoscopic field is caused by the, uh, venous deoxyhemoglobin. In f bold modeling, the vessel is assumed to be if a long cylinder uniformly filled with deoxyhemoglobin. And we have analytic field solution for this infinitely long cylinder shape, as shown in here uh, in a purple. And from this analytic field solution, we take the ensemble average that we can get the signal dropped by deoxyhemoglobin in vein, which is f bold. So let's take a look at this F-bold. So F-bold is a function of venous oxygenation Y and venous blood volume V is, is, is equal to exponential to the minus venous blood volume times this FS. So what is FS? FS is the generalized hypergeometric function. It has two asymptotic behavior. When X is small, it shows quadratic behavior. When X is large, it, has, it shows a linear behavior. And this hypergeometric function Fs is a function of delta omega. So what is delta omega? Delta omega is characteristic frequency. It is basically the susceptibility difference between the vein and the surrounding tissue. So for instance, if the vein is filled with a lot of deoxyhemoglobin, in other words, small y, delta omega would be large because this is, this is small. So delta omega would be large, and it would affect the signal drop a lot. So let's take a look at how f bold behaves. If you fix the venous blood volume at 3%, then smaller y from here to here, smaller y, in other words, more deoxyhemoglobin in vein leads to the greater signal drop. When you fix the venous, uh, venous oxygenation y at 0.6, which is 60%, then the greater venous blood volume, the greater signal drop. And this F-bold shows two distinctive signal decay pattern. 
quadratic behavior at short measurement times and linear behavior in longer measurement times. And due to these two distinctive signal decay pattern, we can decouple Y and V. And Q made, uh, Qbold made an assumption for simplicity. Originally, this characteristic frequency delta omega is a function of Y, venous oxygenation, and chi n, number of tissue susceptibility. And then in Qbold modeling, the chi n, number of tissue susceptibility, is assumed to be constant everywhere in the brain, whole brain, which is equal to the purely oxygenated blood susceptibility chi PO. By doing so, we can treat uh, chi n as a constant. So now, your characteristic frequency delta omega is a function of solely y. However, this assumption might not hold because it uh, ignores the regional variation, such as high positive tissue susceptibility in deep gray matters caused by ferritin and negative tissue susceptibility in white matter caused by myelin. And we remove this assumption by combining QBOL with QSM-based method. Then how about QSM-based method? QSM, quantitative susceptibility mapping, provides voxel by voxel, uh, susceptibility chi voxel. And this chi voxel, voxel by susceptibility, consists of two contributions, blood contribution and non-blood tissue contribution. And from the blood contribution, we can estimate the venous oxygenation Y. So, smaller Y, in other words, more deoxyhemoglobin in vein, leads to greater total voxel susceptibility. However, QSM also made an assumption for simplicity. The, fun the original QSM equation is a function of venous oxygenation Y, venous blood volume V, and the number of tissue susceptibility chi N. However, in QSM modeling, the V, venous blood volume, is assumed to be known based on the linear relationship between venous flow volume, V, and then blood flow, F. So now, QSM is a function of venous oxygenation, Y, and number of tissue stability, chi M. However, this linear relationship between venous flow volume and flow, driven by the whole rate linear regression in healthy adults. So this linear relationship this assumption might not hold for voxel by voxel level and for patient cases, for instance, disease-related abnormal, abnormal cases. We remove this assumption in QSM by combining it with QBOLD model. So, so far, I talked about two prior OEF mapping methods, QSM and QBOLD, and now I'm going to talk about why and how I combine these two to make a new model, which is QQ. So QSN is a function of venous oxygenation Y and number of tissues of stability chi N. It is phase signal modeling, and V, venous flow volume, is assumed to be known. On the other hand, QBOLD is a function of venous oxygenation Y and venous flow volume V, and R2, which is a transverse relaxation rate, and S0, uh, initial signal intensity. QBOLD is a magnitude signal modeling, and chi N, number of tissue susceptibility is assumed to be constant throughout whole brain. And when you look at this carefully, QSM solves for chi N and QBOL solves for V. So by combining these two, we can include V, venous flow volume, and chi N, number of tissue susceptibility in the modeling, which means we can remove two unnecessary and two unrealistic assumptions in each model. Also, we can utilize both phase and magnitude signal from the same data set. So this model, we call it QQ, QSM plus QBOL QQ. Here is optimization regarding QQ modeling. So now the venous flow volume V is included in the QSM term, and chi N, number of tissue susceptibility, is included in QBOL term. And here is the uh, result of QQ. So this is OEF, oxygen extraction fraction map. So QQ, the new model, 
provides more o uniform OEF map than QSM, which is agreed with the literature expectation and reference standard we do not pass. And V, the Venus flow volume map. And QQ shows similar contrast between cortical gray matter and white matter compared to two individual methods. For instance, here, the red versus dark blue here. And this contrast between cortical gray matter and white matter in Venus flow volume consist is consistent with the literature expectation. Also, this QQ shows similar values compared to two methods. And Cayenne map, non-blood tissue susceptibility map. Both QSM and QQ showed a clear contrast between cortical gray matter and white matter, here light gray versus dark gray, also here too. And this contrast in number of tissue stability is consistent with a recently reported mild indifference between cortical gray matter and white matter. And here is a corresponding CMR2 map. Uh, cellular metabolic rate of oxygen map. Basically, this is total amount of oxygen consumed by tissue, CMRO2. First, QSM provides this lack of contrast between cortical gray matter and white matter, unlike the literature expectation. This may be driven by some uh, errors in the tissue segmentation and also another uh, assumption used in QSM method, which is the minimum local variance. Second, QBOLD shows smaller contrast between cortical gray matter and white matter compared to QQ. This may be driven by that QQ shows greater OEF than QBO. You see CMRO2 is a product of CBF and OEF, so the greater OEF, the greater CMRO2. And the greater OEF in QQ may be caused by the inclusion of Cayenne in QQ. So everything is related. So QQ provides higher cayenne number of tissue stability than QBOL, which is assumed to be constant everywhere. And to achieve the same signal decay pattern, the greater uh, cayenne, the greater OEF. And this study provides a new comprehensive biophysics model, QQ. However, this QQ has an issue. Since this QQ is involved with poorly conditioned non-convex optimization because due to the, the uh, coupling among the parameters, it is sensitive to the noise. And this slide shows how result depends on the initial gas with noise. So this gray box indicates the ground truth. So ground truth, the Y value is a 0.6, which is 60%. And the V, the Venus volume is 3%, which is 0.03. This is a ground truth. And then we use a various initial gases for Y and V. And without noise, the result does not depend on uh, initial gas from any, uh, showing the dark blue from any, uh, every initial gases. However, if you add the realistic noise, such as SNR 150, when the initial gas deviates from the truth, the relative the relative error increases. So to re uh, reduce, uh, to resolve this issue, basically to make the QQ model robust to the measurement noise, I develop a new data processing algorithms using uh, artificial intelligence called CAT, Cluster Analysis of Time Evolution, CAT. So basic idea of CAT is we look at the signal evolution with echoes we cluster the voxels with similar signal decay pattern together. And then here, different you know, color indicates different clusters based on this signal decay pattern. And then we set a single parameter values, such as OEF and V, for each cluster. In this way, we can improve the SNR, signal to noise ratio, substantially. For, for instance, if one cluster has 10,000 voxels, then we can improve the SNR effectively 100 times because the square root of 10,000 is equal to 100. And this is a simulation result. So we simulated a stroke brain with low OEF areas here, presumably stroke lesion. And QQ with CAT can capture these low OEF abnormalities in all the SNRs, whereas QQ without CAT does not show such pattern. Also, QQ with CAP provides more accurate OEF map with 
lower root mean square error, RMSE. Here is a real uh, stroke patient data set. This is six days post onset, so this it can be considered as a subacute phase. And QQ with CAT shows this low OEF areas, which agrees with the a lesion defined by an independent MRI contrast, which is DWI, diffusion weighted imaging. Whereas QQ without CAT does not show such pattern clearly. This is CMR2 map, cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen map. The CMR2 is basically the product of OEF and CBF, the cerebral blood flow. And this is VMAP, venous blood volume map. And QQ with, show, uh, with CAT shows this. Uh, a little bit lower the V, the venous blood volume values in the lesion compared to the contractor side, which agrees with the literature expectation. R2 and Cayenne map, non blood tissue susceptibility map. Here is another stroke patient, 12 days post onset. QQ with CAT shows low uh, OEF values, which consist with the DWI defined lesion, whereas QQ without CAT does not show such pattern clearly. This is clear when you look at the histogram. So QQ with CAT shows strongest peak in, at OEF close to zero in the lesion, whereas QQ without CAT does not show, such, uh, show particular OEF distribution corresponding to low OEF values in the lesion. This is healthy subject result. QQ with CAT shows less noisy, more uniform OEF map than QQ without CAT, which agrees with, with the literature expectation. And this is CMR2 map, cellular metabolic rate of oxygen map, good contrast without any uh, extremely high values. And venous blood volume map, V, R2, which is a transverse relaxation um, rate, and Cayenne, non blood tissue susceptibility map. Here is the ROI analysis, region of interest analysis in 11 healthy subjects in cortical gray matter. So, both QQ with CAT and without CAT shows OEF value and CMR2 value, which falls uh, fall into this literature uh, value range. However, QQ with CAT shows substantially significantly lower OEF than QQ without CAT. This may be caused by greater R2 value in QQ with CAT. To achieve the same signal decay pattern, Greater R2 leads to lower OEF. And this study demonstrates that with the CAT algorithm, a new data processing algorithm, QQ can capture low OEF abnormality in stroke. And this was first time to achieve this with single routine MRI sequence. However, QQ with CAT still has some issues. For instance, QQ with CAT shows uh, significantly lower the venous blood volume value compared to the literature value range. Also, when you look at the VMAP, the venous blood volume map itself, QQ shows lack of contrast between gray matter and white matter, which uh, unlike the literature expectation. And this may be driven by limited clusters, you know, using in the CAT. Basically, we only look at the magnitude signal decay pattern and then we group them. So this may lead to limited clusters. So to resolve this issue and to further suppress noise propagation onto OEF map, I developed an, another uh, machine learning algorithm called CCTV, an improved version of CAT. In CCTV, I integrated the tissue type information, gray matter, white matter, CSF, into the CAT clustering by dividing each CAT cluster into three subclusters, gray matter, white matter, and CSF. Based on that, uh, the different tissue type leads to different model uh, parameter values, such as venous blood volume or cayenne. Additionally, I added this total variation regularization on OEF to further suppress noise propagation on OEF. So in a healthy subject, CCTV, the new algorithm, shows less noise and more uniform OEF map than CAT. And uh, the OEF noise suppression may be driven by the total var uh, variation inclusion in CCTV. Additionally, the integration of tissue type information leads to the robust uh, model inversion 
due to, for instance, improved uh, V initialization or model, uh, improved uh, model inversion condition. And then corresponding CMR2 map, the total amount of oxygen consumed map, and V map, venous pool volume map. So CCTV shows clear contrast between cortical gray matter and white matter here, yellow versus like, you know, blue color here, which is consistent with the literature expectation. And this may be driven by the tissue type integration into clustering, which leads to more realistic V initialization in optimization. R2 and Cayenne were not significantly different between CAT and CCTV. In acute phase of ischemic stroke, this is real data set, ischemic stroke patients, yes, CCTV shows less than OGM, more uniform OEF map than CAT, and notably, the CCTV shows similar, almost same OEF values in the lesion, you see this is DWI-defined lesion, compared to the contraretrocyte, which suggests that the lesion tissue may be salvageable. In subacute phase, QQ, the CCTV shows uh, OEF map, the low OEF values largely coincided with uh, DWI defined lesion. For instance, in nine days post onset, the, o the low OEF values from CCTV largely coincided with DWI defined lesion. Whereas CAT, yes, it shows some here, but it's not you know, capturing that clearly. And also it shows this noisy map. You see this dark blue here band, and then this is uh, right band here, that's basically the, presumably the motion artifacts propagation onto OEF map. So CCTV, by integrating the tissue type information, sort of further suppress this kind of noise propagation onto OEF map. To measure how well abnormal uh, lesion OEF is detected, we calculate this CNR, contrast to noise ratio, between lesion and contraretro or healthy side, with assuming that the uh, OEF variation in the healthy side originates, originates from the noise. So in subacute phase, CCTV shows a significantly greater CNR than CAT, as shown in cyan blue. And this greater CNR suggests that the better vision OEF abnormality detection using CCTV. And this may be caused by improved decoupling between OEF and V which is a crucial issue in the cubal based method by using this CCTV. So, so far I talked about uh, two machine learning algorithms, CAT and CCTV, and both CAT and CCTV utilize a uh, gradient based iterative solver. So it depends on the optimization details, such as initial gas and parameter scaling. Also they are time consuming because they use this iterative solver. To resolve this, uh, to address this uh, optimization detail dependency issue, and to make this recon speed fast, much faster, I develop a deep learning approach net. So deep learning you know, approach has been used this kind of, uh, for this kind of uh, inversion problem because uh, any continuous uh, function can be approximate self, a sufficient number of free parameters. So in this deep learning approach, I use this um, established uh, uh, neural network, the convolutional neural network, which is UNET. This UNET was trained with uh, 26 simulated stroke rings. And the deep learning approach NET provides better lesion OEF abnormality detection compared to this machine learning algorithm CCTV. For instance, here, if you see here, this is the DWI defined lesion in the subacute phase. You can see it clearly, whereas CCTV could not capture that. And also, it is much faster, the deep learning approach, which is 150 times faster than the previous CCTV method. Basically, one and a half minute versus three and a half hours. So, so far, I've talked about creating a more realistic novel bifix models for this OEF mapping method, which is QQ. And then I introduced uh, three uh, data processing algorithms to solve this model robustly, which is CAT, CCTV, and NET. From now on, I'm going to talk about the validation of uh, this our method. So basically, we compare our method QQ with 
well investigated another MRI method, which is calibrated fMRI, and the reference standard fictional PET. Because this uh, validation is critical for routine application in the clinical setting. So first, comparison of our method with the calibrated fMRI, um, here, CFMRI. So calibrated fMRI estimate the baseline OEF. Baseline here means a normoxia, OEF. And by considering the bold signal di difference, bold is the blood oxygen level dependent signal difference, by ultra star change between normoxia baseline and vascular challenges here, hyperkemia and hyperoxia. So in order to estimate the baseline OEF, calibrated fMRI needs three different vascular challenges, which is normoxia, hyperkemia, and hyperoxia. Additionally, the CMR2, the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen, is assumed not to be altered between the normoxia and uh, hyperkemia. It's ISO CMR2 assumption. Here are OEF maps at baseline and hyperkemia between calibrated fMRI and our QQ. So compared to calibrated fMRI, this QQ shows more uniform OEF maps and also more uniform OEF values between gray and white matter, which agrees with, with the reference standard description of PET. Compared to QQ, the OEF image quality of calibrated fMRI is visually more variable. It's because, uh, because of this uh, low SNR, signal to noise ratio, in the blood flow measurement and the bold signal measurement, especially in the white matter. That's why you see these really empty spots. It's basically you cannot estimate the OEF there because too low uh, SNR. Compared to baseline, both calibrated fMRI and QQ shows lower OEF at hyperkemia. And this demonstrates that the QQ's sensitivity to physiological OEF changes. And this is important because whenever you apply this method in the clinical setting and you want to make sure that your method is sensitive enough to detect the disease-related abnormality. So this sensitivity is you know, critical prior to clinical application. And this is corresponding CMRO2, celebrated metabolic rate of oxygen, and CBF map in the same subject. And QQ shows good contrast between cortical gray matter and white matter at baseline. Which is uh, which consists with the literature expectation, and also QQ shows slightly lower CMR to map at hyperkemia compared to baseline. And also, please note that in calibrated fMRI, the hyperkemia CMR2 is identical to baseline CMR2. ISO CMR2 assumption was used, and CBF shows significantly higher value at hyperkemia compared to baseline, which is expected. Here is ROI analysis in cortical gray matter, CGM, in 10 healthy adults. So at baseline, calibrated fMRI and QQ show similar at not uh, substantially different OEF and CMRO2, uh, CMRO2 values. However, at hyperkemia, QQ shows significantly lower OEF and CMRO2 than calibrated fMRI. Additionally, QQ shows 17% decrease in CMRO2 at hyperkemia compared to baseline. And this 17% CMRO2 decrease is consistent with the recently uh, reported mild CMRO2 de de decrease during this hyperkemia. And this could be an important uh, contribution to the debate around the ISO CMR2 assumption, which is used commonly used in hyperkemia-based QBO studies, because some study, some hyperkemia-related QBO study says, okay, CMR2 should be remain constant during the hyperkemia. The other study, you know, suggests it, it should be uh, getting decreased. But since our QQ model can estimate the OEF and CMR2 at independently at baseline hyperkemia, so we can say, oh, this is actually 17% CMR2 decrease. And this study uh, provides the OEF values from calibrated fMRI and QQ agrees with each other at baseline level. And the advantage of QQ, which is, for instance, our oxygen estimation without any impractical vascular challenges, 
may enable the clinic application of QQ. So next, we compare our QQ method with the reference standard 15 of PET, positron emission tomography. So 15 of PET utilize this two compartmental tracer kinetic modeling with three different uh, 15 O tracers. 50 O water tracer, 50 O carbon monoxide tracer, and 15 O oxygen gas uh, tracer. So by uh, analyzing this time active curve, first CMR, uh, CBF, the blood flow, and then CBV, the cellular blood volume, was uh, estimated by 15 O water scan and 15 O carbon monoxide scan, respectively. And then finally, OEF was estimated by using 15-O uh, oxygen, oxygen scan with using previously measured or estimated CBF and CBV. So it's a multiple step to get OEF value. Here are OEF maps from PET and QQ in a healthy subject in axial sagittal coronal view. And both PET and QQ show similar values. Also, both PET and QQ shows great scan and rescan reproducibility. And this, you know, scan and rescan re reproducibility should be guaranteed prior to the clinical application. In ROI analysis, region of interest analysis in pan healthy adults, in cortical gray matter, CGM, and white matter, and deep gray matter, such as thalamus, chordate, and putamen, and polydem, PET and QQ shows substantially equivalent OEF values. And this study provi uh, provides that QQ can generate OEF that agrees with 15 of PET OEF, and this was among the first effort to validate an MRI OEF mapping method against the reference standard, so it, its, uh, its importance has been recognized with uh, this uh, prize. So finally, I'll, I'm going to talk about the clinical, my initial clinical experiences of QQ in stroke, multiple sclerosis MS, dementia, and small vessel disease and brain cancer. So first stroke. In an acute ischemic stroke, 18 hours post onset, the red contour, the core, shows on average lower OEF than the healthy tissue, for instance here, which may suggest that the irreversibly damaged tissue, and also the diffusion-perfusion mismatch, the yellow contour, Historically, this was considered as a penumbra, the at-risk tissue, the salvageable tissue. And when you look at this yellow contour, OEF shows a little bit higher value than the core and also compared to the contraretral side. This higher value in the, the yellow contour, the mismatch area, may suggest that the tissue in these regions are salvageable. In 30 ischemic stroke patients, the lesion core shows this decreasing a trend of OEF as the, the time interval between the stroke, con, uh, stroke onset and MRI acquisition increased. You see this dotted, la, a dotted yellow line. Whereas the contralateral healthy side shows you know, remained, uh, remained OEF values. And there are uh, uh, significant changes in OEF among different stages, acute, early subacute, and late subacute. On the other hand, no significant changes were found in other imaging biomarkers except for OEF, for instance, in CMR2 and CBF, which is celebrated blood flow, and ADC, absolute diffusion coefficient, among different stroke phases. This suggests that the OEF may be most sensitive imaging biomarker to tissue functional changes among different stroke stages. Next, multiple sclerosis, MS. So we performed two OEF studies in multiple sclerosis. First study is we focus on chronic active lesion. So if you look at this non-blood tissue accessibility cayenne, you see this bright rim. This is lesion number one, and this is lesion number two. And both of the regions shows this bright rim here this is caused by the iron-containing microglia and microphages because they're, they're, uh, you know, it, it has an active inflammation going on. And since it has an iron-containing you know, microglia, microglia and microphages, that's why you see this bright rim in number of tissue sensitivity. 
and then QQ based OEF shows higher value in the rim versus the core, the irreversibly damaged tissue, cyan blue versus dark blue. And this can be uh, shown via this box plus in 80 lesions. This higher OEF in the rim may be related to active inflammation via ion containing microglia and macrophages in the rim. So active inflammation leads more oxygen, so oxygenation, uh, oxygen extraction will be increased. Compared to age and sex ratio matched healthy control, the multiple sclerosis MS patient shows lower OEF in all the RIs. For instance, the lower OEF in MS in whole brain and cortical gray matter are consistent with the previously reported decreased tissue oxygenation in multiple sclerosis. It may represent the unique tissue injury mechanisms in multiple sclerosis driven by neurodegeneration, progressive neurodegeneration, or demyelination. Also, the lower OEF in degrade matters may represent the tissue atrophy or general loss. For instance, the lower OEF in thalamus is consistent with the, oh no, sorry, uh, related to the neuronal thalamic neuronal loss, previously be reported neuronal thalamic loss or atrophy. And this study was the first report on MS lesion OEF because we could, until this study, we could not achieve this high resolution OEF map. The second OEF MS study focused on acute MS lesion. How can I know this is acute? If you look at T1 weighted image with the gadolinium contrast agent, you see this bright rim here at baseline. It's because BBB, the brain blood barrier, is broken here. It's a newly formed lesion, and then the gadolinium contrast agent is thick. That's why you see this really bright rim here. That's how we can determine, okay, this lesion is newly formed. And then in MS, responding to uh, injury, remyination can occur, which is expected to restore brain functions. And a recent study uh, shows that this remyelination may be energy intensive. So I hypothesize that this remyelination leads to the greater OEF, the greater oxygen extraction. In this study, the myelin contents was measured by this an independent MRI method, which is myelin water fraction and WF. So from baseline to three months, the remyelination is mainly occurring. So from here to here, really dark spot, and this one is like light gray. So remyelination occurred from baseline to three months. And during this time period, OEF in the lesion also increased, dark blue, and almost like, you know, just blue. And this can be via, this can be shown via this also box plot in uh, 57 lesions. So the myelin contents increased from baseline to three months. Also OEF was increased during the, te the time period. And we further found a positive association between OEF change and myelin change from baseline to three months. This suggests that the temporal changes of OEF metabolism may be related to remyelination. Next, we apply this QQ method in dementia. So we ob obtain this OEF map, the QQ-based OEF map, in 68 dementia patients, uh, age over uh, 50, and then age and sex ratio matched 32 healthy control. And then we investigate the association of Q, uh, OEF with the two predictors of dementia age, and white matter hyperintensity burden. And what is white matter hyperintensity burden? If you look at this T2 flare image, you see this really hyper-intense area in the white matter. That's white uh, matter hyperintensity. And the volume fraction of this region compared to the whole brain is white matter hyperintensity burden. So in healthy adults, age, Older age was related to associated with lower OEF, especially in the cortical gray matter, here dark blue. On the other hand, in dementia patients, age was not associated with uh, lower OEF or higher OEF. On the other hand, the higher white matter hyperintensity burden was associated with lower OEF. So for instance, this, this patient 
has this white matter hyperintensity burden 1% relative to the whole brain. And this patient with 3.6% of white matter hyperintensity burden. So this patient, the, the second patient, has three roughly speaking three times higher white matter hyperintensity burden than this one, uh, this, this patient. So this patient, the patient with the higher white matter hyperintensity burden shows lower OEF than the previous uh, patient. And this is association between white matter hyperintensity burden versus OEF. And in dementia patients, the higher, the greater white matter hyperintensity burden was associated with lower OEF significantly in white matter and in hippocampus, not in healthy adults. This is consistent with the previously reported the decreased oxygen metabolism in white matter with higher white matter hyperintensity burden. And based on the white matter hyperintensity association with the Alzheimer's disease pathology, our dementia cohorts likely already have Alzheimer's disease pathology. Regarding age and OEF, healthy in healthy subjects shows this uh, negative association between age and OEF. So older age, lower OEF in cortical gray matter. This is consistent with the previous past studies reporting decreased oxygen metabolism in neopolysis with increasing age. Actually, on the other hand, dementia patient does, does not show such pattern in cortical gray matter. And this lack of association may be driven by, you know, the, driven by that if the cognitive impairment is present, this age-related effect may be overshadowed by disease-related related detrimental effect on OEF. So next, we apply this QQ method in small vessel disease, SPD, the most prevalent you know, pathology for vascular dementia. So we obtain OEF map and CDF, the blood flow map, in 113 healthy subjects and 113 SPD patients. And SPD patient shows lower CBF, the blood flow, than healthy subject. And SPD patient shows greater QQ-based OEF than healthy subject. You see this uh, red spot here? And this higher OEF in the SPD patient uh, may be associated with this compensatory response to decreased C CBF to remain the total amount of oxygen consumption constant so that input is you know, decreasing so that they increase the efficiency. And lastly, a brain cancer. So this slide shows glioblastoma grade four patients and the core red arrows indicates really substantially decreased OEF values, which you know, suggests that irreversibly damaged tissue in the core. However, the edema yellow contour shows heterogeneous values. Here dark blue, here sort of cyan blue, and this is almost normal tissue level. And this heterogeneity is actually a core hallmark of brain tumor. And this preliminary result suggests that our QQ-based OEF mapping method can be used to investigate the metabolic abnormalities in brain cancer. So here comes to the end of my presentation. This is a take-home slide, a novel OEF mapping technique for routine use, including Bifix models such as QQ and data processing algorithm to solve that model, which is CAT and CCTV and NET, and the validation, which is critical for the clinical application, and then some clinical initial applications in stroke, multiple sclerosis, dementia, small vessel disease, and brain tumor. And thank, I thank for my collaborators, and thank you for listening to my talk.